From a marketing perspective, the RS6 is an absolute pin-up on every Delft's bedroom wall. It's the car that lets you do everything and keep your other half happy that it can actually be the practical family wagon, you can avoid an SUV, and when no one's looking, you can put supercar power down on the road. Very, very easy case to make a sale, isn't it? But I have to be honest, I, I don't know which angle I come from with the RS6. There's, there's a couple of things for me. When I was a little bit younger and I drove like a bit more of a, a moron on the road, I was obsessed with lightweight cars and they could have hardly any power, but I was having so much fun in them. And my, the best driving memories I have today are still in Suzuki Swift this, Mazda that, whatever. So a two ton estate with all of that power, all those running costs for straight line fun only, it never sold it to me. I never really followed the hype of each release. However, I'm 32 now and slowly but surely the corners are marching to the, the crown of death here. Things are changing and I now love my 136 brake horsepower Volvo V60. I love bobbing along in my own happy little environment and that's with no power. So now the idea of adding 500 horsepower to that car does weirdly appeal to me and obviously the interior quality on these and everything else is superb but there's some serious running costs with an RS6 like really serious and would its charms to me make it worth the, the risks or the costs and everything else so I want to go drive this and find out so a quick contents list of things coming up and do feel free to skip to any other chapters but obviously we've got the intro we've got the interior we've got the practicality We've got the driving review, we've got running costs, common problems, that kind of thing, and the owner's advice for how much you should budget if you're thinking of getting one of these. And obviously the verdict down here. So let's get on. Right, so second impressions, obviously jumped in first thing when he arrived. So much, much nicer place to be than I thought it was going to be. And really that's down to the carbon trim. So I did watch a little review online first, who doesn't? And it looked refined, not boring, refined, but with this carbon pack, which I've not seen on any of the other reviews, oh my God, it really brings it to life. Loving the carbon top and bottom wheel, little red stitching here with the red leather, the Alcantara. It's very, very evident that you did go top spec and it certainly brings it to life. Other than that, it's as always with Audi, just quality of every single material. You re it really can't be understated. And as someone that did enjoy the Lotus Evora interior that I sat in recently, I thought, oh, that's a lot better than I expected. As soon as you hop into a German car, you are reminded just how far ahead they are in terms of, of, of these things. So spec is really generous on these. Because it's an RS6 and it needs to be better than A6s, it's got loads of stuff as standard. Um, really, really impressive. The thing I want more than anything would be the six grand B&O sound system, the 1200 watt one. Oh, just imagine that. Um, this car doesn't have it, but it does have the Bose sound system, so I think they all have a standard. These seats are delicious. They're really, really cool. They're very, very comfy. Obviously, they have to factor in all different sizes. I think for me personally, I prefer a little bit of pinch, but I'm hardly a bodybuilder. I love the gear knob. It is very Golf GTI. I had a Mark V GTI, a wonderful, problematic piece of crap. I loved that car, but God, it did not love me. And it had a gear, gear knob just like this. So that really, it really takes you back. Super quick review of the back. Really spacious, got loads of headroom, plenty of leg room. I'm six foot, by the way, kind of medium ratio of leg to torso. That's the driving position I was in a minute ago as a six footer, absolutely fine. Heated seats, other things I really like. I love this in my Volvo, and that is the air vents up here. So they're not just blowing into your shins and your knees, but as well, we do still have them down there. So yeah can't knock it to the boot full quentin wilson shot here coming in so the practicality monstrous and i i can't tell you how excited this makes me i'm that sad person but i love v70s i love big old skoda superb estates so this gets me excited i'm going to say 565 liters which is masses you can drop the seats from the back which is nice little areas at the side to pop things into overall you couldn't really ask for more could you So, I'm not going to really do a history lesson as such on the RS6, but the important interesting bit is this is when we left the V10 behind, that lovely 5 litre, 5.2 litre V10. 
Uh, that's the RS6 that actually did have my attention for a long time, thinking that would be quite a fun daily, wouldn't it? Just for that silly engine, at the complete cost of it handling. And I think every RS6, including the previous generation, they'd really disappointed with their handling and felt very heavy and very stodgy. And this is supposed to be the first RS6 where they'd sorted that out and really managed to make the car behave like the sporty car it claims to be. Now, obviously, we're not going to put that in the same sentence as 911 sportiness or Lotus sportiness or even M3 sportiness, but it wouldn't just feel like a lump that you're asking a bit too much of it. Speaking of lumps and too much, that brings me nicely to power. And we've got a massive four litre V8 with twin, twin scroll turbocharged. I think we find that hard to say. Twin, twin scroll turbocharged going on. And it's 20 horsepower down on the V10, but quite a bit up on the torque. And so much so, I put it on the screen, can't remember the number, but so much so that this car goes from 0 to 60 1.2 seconds quicker than the previous RS6 with 20 less horsepower. <laughs> For sake! <laughs> oh my god! It's, oh, it's um. So this is about 3.7 to 60 has been tested and timed. That is bananas. That is Audi R8 V10 0 to 60 in an estate, and. I am a firm believer of slow car fast is more fun than fast car slow and you don't need horsepower to have a chuckle and stuff and there does come a point in most cars where you simply have too much power to use for the road and you're beginning to really overwhelm those rear wheels and frankly your confidence begins to drop through the floor. That doesn't beat it for me, it beats a slow car, you're attacking it 100%. However, I have to say, I've driven a few cars with this kind of power but none of them give you that instant confidence like this does. This completely unshakable four-wheel drive system is really impressive. I found myself just going, let's go 100% power in second gear, which I don't think I'd do in anything about 400 horsepower in any other car, frankly, not at a low speed. And it is bananas. Everybody says the power is absurd and I've, I'm not a stranger to cars going quickly. I felt my stomach muscles after, after going quickly. I could feel that I'd been clun clutching. My organs practically ache. 30 miles an hour, slightly wet road. 60. <laughs> that is ridiculous. It is. Oh God, that's with two adults in the car. One of the things I'm really glad is that those turbos haven't muted the hell out of this engine. And the irony is it's a louder V8 in here than the Ford Mustang that I drove recently, completely naturally aspirated, stock exhaust. This has a lot more aural drama, if that's the right pronunciation of it. This feels really exciting. And upon reflection, that Ford Mustang, you expected it to be louder and it hasn't left me with a feeling of like, wow, God, you've got to hear how that sounds. I think that's an engine waiting to be unlocked. I think they've done a fantastic job so far with this engine. It is, it is bonkers. Talk about living with a car every day. It's an Audi A6 underneath. And whilst they might be long, I don't, it doesn't feel like a massive barge. It doesn't feel intimidatingly long or very, very wide. I don't, I'm not bothered by that at all. And if anything, I think it hides its size pretty well. I also have to say, by the way, just this bit here, probably the first time I've really been able to like test it in the bends a little bit. And the Audi steering has got a hell of a lot better than the VW steering and quite a few products I've driven from only a few years either side of this. They've done a very good job. It kind of weighted up nicely and did feel I, I have to be careful when you use the word connected because so many cars are far more connected to the road. But previously, <laughs> I felt more connected to the car in front of me than the car I was actually steering in a lot of um, you know, an old TT, for example. As Chris Harris said recently, the weight figure is irrelevant 
if the car doesn't feel like that weight. And that's really interesting. I've not heard anybody say that before. This does not at all feel like a two-ton car. It feels planted. It's very comfy. It's not crashing over everything. I really thought, hang about. Fifty-eight, fifty-six, fifty-five. <laughs> that's amazing. So the weight, um, you know, I wouldn't take this on track and lob it about, but who the bloody hell buys one of these thinking that's what you're going to do with it? Nobody. I was expecting it to feel a bit stodgier. I was expecting it to feel crashier. Um, and I certainly feel ironically quite safe in this when we're absolutely planting it. What we got going on here then? Nothing that 550 horsepower can't fix. At this point, we're probably a little bit bored of us talking about acceleration and power. So let's move on to ride comfort, everything else related to that. Now, I drive a Volvo V60, no sport suspension. And I love that thing. And obviously 160,000 miles, slightly tired suspension, but it still feels great. I was expecting there to be a very harsh comparison getting into this. And that's probably what I would have told someone without having tried it. The importance of trying things before you make your judgments. This thing is so comfortable and it handles the bumps like an absolute champion. I really didn't expect it to be this composed and this comfortable. And I was expecting to be a lot of compromise. There's a lot of adjustable suspension stuff you can do. This has got the air suspension. And if you do a bit of Googling, they say to go with steel and the air can be expensive when it goes wrong. And that if you look at the fact that the press cars all went out with steel suspension, basically, it's adjustable, by the way, um, that that's the way to go. Well, I haven't at any point driving this yet felt like I'm losing out on, the, on this being air suspension. On a wet day, with all this power and the roads are quite busy, I'm gonna be respectful to the owner and not be a complete bell end. He's told me it still rides flat. You put this in dynamic, it'll go around to a corner completely flat. And I don't think you're kind of wishing it had more. And ultimately, this is the car's objective is not to do that stuff. It's, it can, but not in a rewarding way. I don't think that would you know, have you laughing your head off, but it's there to munch the motorway miles, to do a surprisingly a fantastic job of carrying life's daily duties and making sure you're not bored in the commute. So whilst we're in boring conditions, it's probably a good time to talk about the little things that make a difference to dull driving. And that is infotainment and whatnot. Now, I used to be someone that always wanted the latest this and I would retrofit CarPlay and Android Auto into a car and whatnot. But actually, now, I don't really mind so much. As long as I've got Bluetooth called, built in, I can send my music and my calls over, great. And if I have a phone in the windscreen, not bothered. Um, and this car sits in that era where thankfully, visually, things feel modern and sharp and colorful and decent displays. We're pre-Android Auto and CarPlay coming as standard, but you can retrofit um, some bits and pieces. So we've got wireless CarPlay and Android Auto on here now. So that's good. Um, and overall, it doesn't feel dated in here at all. I, I know a lot of brand new cars feel like they're from the future, so it's not gonna have that feel. But Audi design, it always feels contemporary, even if it's not exciting. It just feels kind of timeless. I feel like Mercedes interiors can age like milk. And I think probably 2013, 14 was when they finally began to design things that will probably stand the test of time. The Bose sound system, I think it sounds very, very good. Um, not one of the best sound systems I've heard. And amazingly, I always come back to Volvo sound system. I don't know what it is or who it is that works in their audio department, but for cars that under-promise, they over-deliver. And I think when you get into expensive cars with both sound systems, I think they begin to over-promise and slightly under-deliver. Now, it still sounds great, but one of the things I... Oh my God. Wipe down seats, wipe down seats, wipe down seats. Oh my God. I wouldn't otherwise say this car's too wide, but that wasn't nice. <laughs> so the sound system, I found, I mean, I'm sure you can change with the panner a little bit, you know, bring the sound a little bit, um, centralize the sound a little bit more, but in the stock setup, everything sounds like it's coming from in front of you, like the windscreen is playing you music. Um, and I personally have not been a fan of that. My brother's Kia Stinger GTS, that has the same thing.
Whereas my Volvo has the sound kind of a little bit more like you're wearing headphones. Not quite, but it just surrounds you better. And I think there's a better sound stage in the car. Let's go on to owner stuff. Now, everybody knows an RS6 is going to be expensive to own. We're not idiots, but I think people underestimate still, despite knowing they're going to be expensive. You're still talking about a 90,000 pound car. Whatever you buy it for, you have to remember you're buying a 90 grand car. And that it's not just, oh, parts are gonna be crazy. Labor is the difficult, complicated bit. Matthew, the owner, had an oil pressure sensor go in the engine. 27 pound part, 37 pound part, not much. But labor, to get to where it was, 600 pounds. That's That just gives you an idea. These cars really get through their brake pads, their brake discs. People say they go through them very, very, very quickly. Now, he did an amazing job of getting discs and pads fitted for two grand. And that's, that's incredible because Audi, just for the discs, no labor, no pads, they wanted 2,100 pounds for the discs. And I've seen quotes of people saying three, 4,000 pounds to change a set. It's just a very expensive car to run and you need to have maintenance money ready. Now, Audi in the rankings score badly with reliability and they have for a long time. They're really out of the top 30 manufacturers, you're kind of battling for 25th, battling for 21st. They're not great. And then they come with the extra cost when things go wrong. And I always like to warn people about that, but you just have to be aware. But the nice thing is, the RS6 here is one of the more reliable models and it doesn't seem to have crazy, crazy common, uh, common issues. There is, there is one to do with the coolant hose um, splits in, in cars pre-2015 and that can be pretty catastrophic. That is, that is something to be very aware of. Um, by catastrophic, I don't know if you're going to lose the whole engine over it, but you bloody wouldn't want that to happen. I'm not sure the preventative measures are for that because I can't be an overnight expert on everything I review. But do jump in the comments sections because some very anoraki types will helpfully fill in those gaps, I'm sure. Other than that, he said these alloys and the wheels are just made of chocolate and he's had every single wheel dented and he's had to have them bent back and you know straightened from not massively significant potholes. 21 inch rims, thin tires, crap B roads, heavy car. It's, it, every, it happens to everybody all the time. And it's just gonna be an expensive thing to upkeep. So just be aware of those things. And really, his buying advice, when I said like, what would you say to somebody with a 30 grand budget to get into like one of the more affordable uh, RS6s? And what would you say to somebody who's got 35 grand? And he said, well, you're gonna want at least four grand in cash ready to go for your maintenance on this car. It will cost you more. He, he's had a lot of Audi products. He's had some RS stuff before, I think an RS3. It's not his first rodeo, but he said even then it's like, Jesus, the costs are so, so high. And ultimately one of the angles for me on this whole video is I've now concluded the hype is correct. This car is brilliant. It's really fun. It's it's a hilarious way to get around. It's not dy driving dynamics. It's not something I'm going to remember, but that's not why you bought the car either. And to improve your day-to-day -day journeys, if you can afford the fuel and everything else, cool. But I'm still wondering with my own money, what I would do if I, if I could stomach the running costs and the risk for an estate that I enjoy blasting in a straight line. I'm not sure. I think if I was wealthy enough to have something else really, really fun as well, and then I'm somebody that doesn't take my, I don't know, my Lotus out or my 911 or something as much, but I need to get around to work and I've got the extra money still to just piss into the wind, this would be brilliant. If it was my only car and I was choosing it to do the one and all stuff, or I could split that budget and have a perfectly decent daily, and a sense of occasion sports car on the side, I think I'd do the latter. And that's not knocking this, I just think, I think I would rather have two cars where they do their jobs, each of their jobs, even better. 
I'd, I'd like something that feels like a 911 to drive at the weekend and something that focuses on all those extra layers of luxury and comfort. But that's not really because this feels like it's, it's lacking, to be honest. I just think it makes more sense. So I've said what I would do in terms of buying this car. I could see a, ver a version of me, a, a reality where I would love to own this car. I just think it is an incredible all-in-one car and it deserves the praise that it gets. Uh, I don't drive cars like a lunatic anymore in the bends like I used to when I was younger and felt a bit more invulnerable. I've seen a couple of horrible crashes. I pulled someone out of a flipped car and it's a reality check not to just drive like a bell end for the rest of your life. And so do, does it really matter that it doesn't handle that brilliantly? No, not really for the buyer, for most buyers of these cars. And I do a lot of dull miles now, so I think it could be really fun. As long as I had the funds, I think I would still really enjoy only one of these. Who is it for? Well, in, in Matthew's example, he's a big Audi fan and his history is TTS, A5, RS3, RS6. So if you've already come from the school of Audi in this philosophy and you love the way these things do the daily stuff, none of those things are going to concern you. You're going to love this car. If you've come from cars with a sportier heritage and maybe you've always come from M3s or 911s and Caymans or whatever else, I think then you would feel the step back in driving dynamics. I think that's fair to say. What should you spend? Uh, I think don't go near the beginning. Don't go for the 30K ones, I don't think. This is at the time of recording, 2024 anyway. I think with all of these kind of cars, you need to buy a slightly better example, try and avoid some issues, and then you still need quite a bit of change for it. I've been driving a lot of things in this neighborhood recently, Evora S, uh, 911s, and uh, Mustang, Kia Stinger GTS, F-Type, all sorts of things. And this is something that's quite interesting, actually. So despite having basically fallen down the Audi family tree, or sorry, gone up the, the Audi family tree this entire time, Matthew actually found my channel by looking for Kia Stinger GTSs, and he found my review of my brothers. Because, you know, it does sometimes stress him out about costs and running costs and surprise bills or that kind of thing. Um, and as someone who now wants to take a bit of cash out of his car and try and buy like a fun motorhome to go adventuring in, he thought, what can I get that gives me the RS6 practicality and excitement and experience, but a bit lower down without that kind of reliability worry and running cost worry. So if this sounds like you and you're considering a car like this, do go and check the GTS out. It's a fantastic car and I think you'd absolutely love it. But overall, I'm really, really impressed with the RS6 and it's made me properly appreciate a brand that I felt mostly lukewarm slash unfussed by for a very long time. I've got a crush on one of these and I can see why the hell I'd want one one day. Massive, massive thank you to Matthew. As a random viewer like all of you at home, he just took up, took up the opportunity, sent me an email and said, I've got an RS6, do you want to do it? So if you have anything, please do get in touch because it does happen. I'd just like to also ask if you would like to take a look at the Patreon, like and subscribing, stuff like that. I'm trying to make this a full-time gig and it's really difficult. It's, it's a lot of work and not much money at all that comes out of this. So any way you can support, we massively appreciate it. Thank you and we'll see you in the next one.